So I'm going to show you here again the example project that we're striving toward, just to remind you. You can look at it yourself also on your mobile device or desktop or laptop. vmcampus.com slash sdce. We saw this last time, but a quick reminder and also for the new people. If you visit that address, you will see the example of what we're striving toward by the end of this course. If you see it on your mobile device, you will see the full effect in that it is a mobile-friendly website. I'm looking at it on my desktop, so it doesn't look mobile-friendly. It looks like a regular old website. But at the very bottom, if you click on mobile site, then it should take you to a mobile-friendly looking website. Well, since we're all probably accessing it, we're crashing my server. But uh, here it comes. There we go. So if you look at it on your mobile device, you should just see this automatically. It detected that you were on a mobile device, and therefore it served you the mobile version. If you visit it on your laptop or desktop, uh, it detected that, and it showed you the desktop version right there. So if you are looking at it on mobile, or if you, if you click the link at the bottom to visit the mobile, then you'll get the, that sense of what we've already looked at. We've got these various screens, we've got these widgets, we've got content and pictures, side menus that open up like that, pop-up windows, and so forth. We've already looked at this. We've seen also the uh, extra features like customization where uh, user input the app takes user input and just kind of proof of concept. It takes user input and then it shows the person's name throughout the app. So welcome, Victor Campos. Learn about computers, Victor Campos. So that is a real example. I can change that. And now it's going to say, welcome, Johnny. So that's something we'll be doing. More impressively, we will also uh, link to external content. Here is the college's official school catalog. And even more impressively, we're going to be able to get directions, and this works best on your mobile, where it's going to use the GPS capabilities of your device to locate where you're at and then give you turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions to this campus. So notice that. That's a real map. And as we saw last time, you can pinch and zoom and scroll and even do street view and everything. This is a real Google map. It's not a static image. You can actually use it like a map. And that's what we're going to end up in the end of the course uh, at the end of the month. So what we were doing last time was if you had no experience at all, you'll still be able to get to this point. If you've had some experience, you'll get to this even faster. And if you had a lot of experience, you'll still probably learn a few things here and there. So, any questions so far? In addition to recording the lectures, I am also providing all the work that I do in class. I'm putting it in a network folder for you to access, to remind you. And again, if you don't have a computer, uh, make sure you, before you leave, uh, talk to me or access an open computer. But um, I've got a network folder for you where, I, where I'm going to give you the syllabus, where I'm going to give you copies of my work. In case you didn't quite end up at my point, you can take a copy of my work and see perhaps where you went wrong. And I do that at the end of every class meeting. So on the desktop, in the computer window, go to computer in the, on the desktop. And then you'll see the network location drive Z, Z as in zebra. Z as in ZFS. And then open the classroom data disk. Scroll down to find my instructor's folder, Campos Android 1. It's alphabetical. All the instructors are, are listed here that have a folder. It's all alphabetical, uh, except for Zach, because he cheated. And um, Campos Android 1. So if you open that up, it's got a copy of the syllabus which you can get a copy of that and print it if you'd like. But during the break, please, because the printer's a little noisy. 
And also, there's a copy of my work from June 9th. So you can take a copy of that, which was just a, a fun, um, basic HTML thing that we did together. Which was an introduction for those of you that had no experience in HTML and CSS. We talked about HTML5 and CSS3. We'll get back into our workflow of editing documents and such in a moment, but I'm just reminding you this is what we ended up with last time. There we go, so very basic. Some text, a picture, a link. That's all HTML based, just a foundational HTML5 document. We added some design, some colors and so forth with CSS. And then we added um, some uh, CSS3. Now, I opened this up in an older web browser. I opened it up in Opera 9. And one thing that you might recall is missing regarding CSS3. Do you want to remember? Remember, CSS3 is sort of like icing on the cake. Shadow. Drop the drop shadow. The drop shadow behind my picture is missing. But if you never knew that, no problem. It's still You still see the picture. So the drop shadow was not mission critical. Interestingly, it did show the rounded corners. So this is what I'm saying about CSS3 is for newer browsers, but this is, this is Opera version uh, 9, and I think it's already like on 20-something. So there we go. I'm looking at it in a newer uh, Firefox, and now we see the shadow, actually a little glow. So it was OK that other browsers, older browsers, didn't see it. You might have taken other classes, and in there we talk about progressive enhancement and vendor prefixes and so forth to be able to show our special tags to every browser. But there was a very uh, uh, controversial and interesting uh, web design article that came out a, a few years ago called To Hell with Old Web Browsers. <coughs> because they're going to evolve. Someone buys a new computer, it's not going to have Internet Explorer 6. It's not going to have Opera 9. Someone's going to get the latest web browsers on their computer. And yes, there's a large population that they cannot upgrade for whatever reason. People come to these classes and tell me I've got Windows XP. No, I'm not putting anyone down that has Windows XP, but Windows XP is how many years old? It's more than a decade old. And so we are going to be talking about the latest, CSS3, HTML5, JavaScript, jQuery Mobile. So older browsers won't be able to handle some of these things, but we're not designing for, for older web browsers. We're, we're designing ultimately for an app. And our apps on our devices, these have the latest technology, basically. So what about tablets? tablets will also work because they are also pretty modern and often are in line with the operating systems of the mobile device, of the, of the phones. That's why we say mobile device, because that includes phones and tablets. Do you get, do you get a generic tablet or do you have to get one of those? No, well, whatever tablet. You know, and any new modern tablet should, uh, any off-the-shelf tablet, uh, brand name or not is a modern tablet, so this stuff will work. People come in these classes with a brand new shiny Google Nexus or uh, a brand new Samsung Galaxy S6 or the, the latest and greatest. And they also come in with a ZTE whatever and a Huawei whatever and all of these that are not that well known and they still work. So that's one of the cool things about Android that it is uh, pretty universal. And we will be creating apps that will be targeting old devices to new devices. Android 2.2 all the way up to the newest Android. Uh, Android uh, L. What's L again? Lollipop, yes. And the new one, Android M, is that, that's Milkshake, right? Android M, have you heard of that one yet? It's going to come out eventually. But anyway, that's a quick recap of looking at what we saw of what we did last time. Um, we're going to begin a brand new document today, so we'll get some practice with writing the basic code again, and then go into high gear uh, to create a much more full-featured project like the one that I'm showing here. So yes, we will be able to create something like this on day two, even though you think, well, I learned a few tags, and 
I checked out the website w3schools.com and there's a hundred tags and how are we gonna get to this point if we barely know this? Well we're going to tap into a framework that allows us to get up and running quickly. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. It's useful to know what we're doing but I'm not gonna waste my time writing an app from scratch every time. I could and in the beginning I used to, when I first started also doing websites, I learned the code and I wanted to do it all myself, so I would write it every, all the code, every line. But then eventually, when you're on a deadline or you've got a demanding client and so forth, it's going to be a waste of your time and money for you to be starting every time from scratch with a blank document. So we're going to start with, we're going to use frameworks that get us, uh, that get us some of the way there, and it's up to us to get us all the way there. All right, so what was the um, code editor that we're using in this class again? Notepad++. Notepad++. Uh, did anyone go home and download Notepad++? Okay, did anyone go home and download Text Wrangler if you're on the Mac? Okay, so if you, if you didn't, uh, either you've got your own code editor of choice, keep at it, or uh, you're not practicing what you're learning in class. Now, there's no homework in these classes. There's no grades in these classes. There's no final project. There's no certificate. It's all for you to learn something practical and tangible, real, by the end of the course. So you get out of it what you put into it. I'm not giving any grades. I'm not giving any homework. And therefore, if you're learning this stuff and you yourself are not also doing some of it outside of class, perhaps it's not going to stick as much because it, it's true that if you don't use it, you lose it. I remember taking an Adobe Illustrator class years ago and I thought I got good at it. A couple of years passed without me really touching it and then I needed to do a logo in Illustrator and I was struggling. First of all, because it was a different version of Illustrator. And second, because I was forgetting what do the buttons do, what do the menus do. So if we're talking about code, you're gonna forget, is it a less than or is it a greater than and do I need a closing bracket if you don't keep doing it? So I do recommend uh, keep doing it outside of class. So let's go to the Start menu, and let's search here for Notepad++, and we will load Notepad++. So run the Notepad++ application. Let's go to the top uh, file menu and create a new document. So let's go to file new. And in this brand new empty document, let's save this. File, save as. If you brought a USB flash drive, you can save it to your drive. If not, you can save it to the desktop, and I forgot to say last time, I apologize. These computers have a software called Deep Freeze, which means that anything you save on the desktop or anywhere on the computer, once you restart the computer, it erases. So any of the work that you might have left on the desktop, expecting it to be here again, unfortunately was erased. So Deep Freeze sets our computer back to factory settings whenever you turn them off. That's good and bad, of course. It's bad for you because you're going to lose your work if you don't take it with you if you don't put it on a USB or if you don't email it to yourself. But it's good because if a computer gets a virus or someone uh, you know, saves an inflammatory picture to the desktop or something, we just restart the computer and it goes back to our factory settings. And this is a public lab. We don't want you, your Gmail to still be logged in because you forgot to log out. As soon as you turn off our computers, everything resets. <coughs> so here, Let's save as. I'm going to save on my flash drive. I'm going to call it today's date, June 11th. And very important, remember to save as type what? HTML. HTML. 
the longest one here, hypertext markup language. I think it'll work if you type it manually, but I feel safer if I make sure that I select save as type, HTML. Okay, so we have again an empty document. We're going to write some basic code again. A little bit of practice again from last time, but then we're going to go into high gear because I'm going to introduce new concepts, specifically concepts of HTML5, HTML5 semantics, and on, then also a framework that will allow us to create an interface pretty quickly. So we'll start with the basics like we did last time. We have to have line one declaring what kind of document we have. So remember we start the angle brackets and then exclamation point doc type space HTML. We're saying we are creating an HTML5 compliant document. We write the HTML tag and its pair, HTML slash HTML. It says that everything between these, these two tags is an HTML document. And then at this point I forgot, what did I do last time? What's next? Header. Title, almost, but we need header. The header tag. If we've got a header, not header, head, head, header or something else, head, if we've got head, what else do we have? Title, yes. So let's add the title tag. In this case, I'm writing it um, in a single line. Remember last time I wrote it in multiple lines, and I said that it doesn't matter. The web browser won't care. It'll render it properly. I'll just write it like that for a moment. So if we've got head, what else do we need? Body. Notice what I'm doing. I'm uh, dividing up into multi-lines the sections that will have more than one line. That's my sort of uh, way I do it, my practical way. So I have head, a couple of lines, slash head. I have body, a couple of lines, slash body. Whereas title, I wrote it on one line, and that's simply because I'm just going to write one sentence here, so I don't really want to waste three lines if I could just use one line. I'll get to title in a moment. That was one of the things we did early on. But before title, does anyone else remember what we did here? The meta tag, which was defining the character set of what uh, languages we can use, of alphabets, that is. So back up here, line four, this is the meta tag. But this is one of the tags that is not a pair. This is a self-closing tag. Oops. I should follow my own advice. This is a uh, self-closing tag, so it's just one opening tag. But it does have attributes. Car set, or char set, if you want to say it wrong. UTF-8. And here we're basically saying we are accessing the whole 8-bit character set, which is full of uh, like 16,000 or 32,000, I think, 32,000 different characters. All the letters of the English alphabet, Spanish alphabet, Cyrillic alphabet, Hebrew alphabet, lots and lots and lots of alphabets. So right here we can basically use any letter, just about any letter of any language. So in these 10 lines, well, nine if I remove this extra space as my placeholder. In these ten lines, I have a very, very, very basic HTML file, a very basic foundation of an HTML file, which will eventually become my app. We won't see anything if we check it in the web browser, so let's add just one or two little quick visual things, and then we will uh, see our results. So for the title, Line 5. Let's write today's date. And in the body, 
want to write some text, but I want some I want to write text that is that catches your attention, that is big and bold and meaningful. What tag might work there? H1, heading 1. And I also want to write a heading 2 as a subtitle of sorts. And I will write here jQuery mobile framework. And then a plain old paragraph after that. And day 2. So again, we did this pretty much last time. Quick practice. If you're new, again, the more you do it, the more you'll remember, the less errors you'll have. If you've had experience, sometimes it's uh, nice to brush up with the basics again. And this is a web page. I want to see it in the web browser. I want the web browser to render this to take these codes that I can't really deal with as a human and render them into something that I can deal with as a human. So our workflow is we write some code, we save our work. Remember the floppy disk up here is reminding us we have not saved. We want to save. And then I want to see it in the web browser. How do I do that again with Notepad++? Up on the Run menu, we can choose a web browser. And as I said, I'm using Firefox just because it's the first on the list. You can use Chrome if you'd like, or Internet Explorer, or Safari. Uh, Opera's not on the menu, but you can manage. And then also, uh, keyboard shortcuts. So you're probably used to Control s to save and Control p to print. Well, we also have other handy keyboard shortcuts to load a web browser. Control alt shift x that'll load Firefox, or Control-Alt-Shift-R, and that'll load Chrome. You think, well, that's a big handful. But as you do it enough times, you'll get into the practice of uh, writing code, press Control-S to save, and your hand's already there, perhaps. And you might as well do Control-Alt-Shift-X, uh, <coughs> and it already loads it up in the browser. Or run launch Firefox. So there's my very basic site so far, June 11th on the title. There's the heading 1, because it's big and important, and it's of hierarchy number 1. Hierarchy number 2 is jQuery Mobile Framework, heading 2, and then a plain old paragraph. This is what I've got so far. We'll go on in a moment. Did everyone get this? Does anyone need a little help? All right, so this is reiterating what we did last time. And if you looked at the website that I mentioned last time, w3schools.com, there was more depth that we can get into on some topics. If you go there, there will be also a step-by-step -step tutorials on every aspect of HTML we won't have time and we don't need to get into every aspect of HTML in this class. We're going to learn things on a need-to-know basis to be able to accomplish what we want to accomplish in this class, which is to make this app that has this map feature, that has this customization feature, that has a database, and so forth. So I recommend check out this site if you want to learn more. What we're going to talk about here is starting to set up our project so that eventually it will be an app. An app, whatever app you have installed, has multiple screens, right? Probably a home screen where maybe you log in. After you log in, you might see a timeline. Let's say, let's think about it in terms of Instagram. How many of you have heard of Instagram before? 
with most people. Okay, how many of you have heard of Facebook before? Okay, most people. So you see a home page. If you, if you install the, the Facebook app for the first time, it asks you to log in. So that's one screen. And then you, you log in. Then the next screen is probably the timeline, and it shows you a bunch of content there. And then you might go over to another screen, the, the photos screen, and another screen to check other things. So there's different screens. All of those screens will exist within our one file here. It's going to be known as an SPA. Now don't write this here, but maybe make a note. SPA. That's a single page app. We will be able to include all aspects of our app in one HTML document. We could separate it into multiple documents. If you've had some experience in in web design, you might you might be comfortable or familiar with creating an index HTML file which links to a contact.html file which links to a shopping cart.html file and each one of those separate files has a doc type, head, body, etc. and that's been traditional that's been traditional web design different files for different screens but we're gonna tap into an SPA, a single page app, in that all of our pages will be within this one file within the HTML tags. And that has pros and cons. One of the cons is that instead of having 40 lines of code for page 1 and 40 for page 2 and 60 for page 3, you're going to have all of those 200 lines in one document. So you're going to have to kind of dig around your code a little bit more to find the right line. So one con is that you'll have a much longer file to work with. But one way around that is search. We've got the ability to search throughout our document. So if we know we're trying to edit the contact page, we can do search, find, contact. If we named the element properly, we can find within our document. That should be pretty obvious. Con, larger file to maintain and edit. A con is there could be, could have performance issues. If you've got a thousand line long HTML file with a lot of stuff going on, it could slow things down. When one element is loading, uh, and it's preventing another element from loading, then you could have a slow user interface. This is probably not going to be big of an issue depending on most people's apps. You're probably not going to be writing a thousand lines of code here. You could. And even at a thousand lines, I don't think there's going to be a big performance issue because we're using, we're going to be using jQuery, which helps speed things up. But it could be an issue. A pro or a positive, so a negative and a positive, a positive of having a single page app is we'll be able to use transitions. Transitions or uh, animations. Animation. Specifically between screens. All of those cool animations that you see on websites going from a screen to another screen are often happening because an SPA is in effect. Things are being loaded from one file, and therefore we can animate that. In the traditional method of having an index HTML file linked to a contact HTML file, the, the animation ability is broken. We won't be able to have a cool fade from one page to the other as easily, or a, a cool flip or rotation animation between those two because they're separate files. If we keep them all in one file, we will be able to have animations and transitions. You think, well, that's, that's a waste. Why would I care about that? Think about all of the apps that you use, and they have some kind of animation because it's good user experience. It lets people know that when they tap something and something slides up, it changes the person's focus to look at the new 
paradigm, the new screen, and interact with it. If you've got a gentle transition, a gentle fade from one thing to another, that's better for a person to not be jarred to then be um, disoriented. Where am I at in the app? What happened? If they tap something and then suddenly a side panel appears without a smooth slide in, that's jarring, that affects the user experience. And this is a big topic, user experience. There are people that have that job title, user experience designer or user experience expert, where their job is to make the experience of using your app the best possible. And one way to do that is with effective communication, like trans transitions. A pro also is all your code is consolidated. So it could make more sense in total. Because it might be a little more confusing to work with three different files, five different files, twelve different files, and then have to orient yourself in the code to understand what you've done with all of those separate files. So those are a few pros and cons there. Any questions? Yes? Just one quick um, on the uh, CSS file, mm -hmm. um, is that also recommended? Is that in the HTML file? Which That's a good point. Uh, that one uh, actually goes against, um, not the rule, but that, that's a good example where, yes, a uh, little uh, off topic, but I would say, however, well, let's write it like this, uh, all HTML in one file, all CSS in one file, and then all JavaScript in one file. So no, I would not put all of the JavaScript and the CSS and so forth in this one file. Then I think it then does get much more cumbersome because then you're dealing with three types of code in one file. We can easily then link this HTML file to multiple CSS files or multiple JavaScript files and keep that code in the right place. All right, so uh, hopefully you wrote this down. I'm going to erase it. I'm going to put it in another file and I'll save it to the network folder a little later. Call this notes. So, this one, uh, this one file is what's going to have our, our 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 project and our separate screens. So what we're going to do is we're going to start writing some HTML5 code, new tags that were invented rather recently, that their purpose for existing is to give more meaning to your document. You might have heard of the concept semantic HTML. That's about giving meaning to your to your content. Uh, there's already semantic HTML that's been around for a long time, but there was a dark ages for a long time in web design where people were using the wrong tag for the task. There was, for example, um, don't write this, never write this, font there was a tag called font. And in the old days, this was amazing. This was a tag that would allow us to edit the font of our, of our, of our uh, text. And it worked. But then when we got to more complicated projects, it really, really did not work. Because if, let's say, and I don't even remember the, the syntax for it, but let's just say, uh, I don't know, font face uh, onyx, something like that no need to really know it. It used to be that we were saying this font has the, this text has the, has the font onyx and therefore another uh, section over here had another uh, font face and so we would have two different fonts. Great. But then, what if we had 40 instances of fonts? What if we had 400 instances of fonts? Now we would have to change all of those. So we'd have to go line by line, or maybe we could get a little help with search and replace, 
and and replace those things and then it was then the then the question was well isn't there a better way to do this and yes the better way is css we can attach a css rule to the fonts and then make one change in one css file and that will apply to all 400 words so what i'm getting at is that there should be a the right tag for the right job and the font tag is no longer the right uh, tag for the right job so that's why no one ever really teaches this anymore but tags that do still matter and that have meaning are for example title tag it displays text up on the tab like this but it also has a meaning because the web browser can display it in a special way in the title. Mm -hmm. Heading 1 and Heading 2 have a meaning. We don't want to use a Heading 1 tag just to make something big and bold. We want to use a Heading 1 tag to say this is the most important section divider of our document. And Heading 2 is a subtitle or a second most important bit of text. So these have a meaning. Heading 1 has a semantic meaning. Heading 2 has a meaning. P has a meaning. It's a paragraph. Body has meaning. In HTML5, new tags were invented with even more meaning. So that's what we're going to write right now. We're going to divide up our project into multiple screens. So there's a tag that will help us do that. Uh, for the moment, I'm going to I'm going to push down with three lines, one, two, three. I'm going to push down what we've already written. We're going to move it into place in just a moment, but I'm going to push it down just to focus on these tags first. And I'll back up to line eight. We have an HTML5 tag called section, and it has a pair. So let's write the section tag. This tag didn't exist until a few years ago. Um, five or seven years ago or so, and other tags that didn't have, have existed 20 years, uh, 25 years. So this is a pretty new tag, and again, this won't work with some older browsers, but again, we're not focusing with, we're not focusing on older browsers. And what this will do is, eventually, when we get to that point, this will be the different screens of our app. Simply by having a section tag, here's the home screen another section tag, here's the about screen, another section pair, here's the contact page, section. So inside of section, I'm going to go between section and tab that. There were other tags that were developed because over and over and over designers were doing the same thing. They were using a div tag, which we'll talk about later. It's still useful, a div tag, to make a division in the document and then give it meaning. But by default, the div tag itself has no meaning. It's like an empty container. So tricks that people were doing were creating a div pair, and in here putting a nav bar, and then using a trick about adding an ID. You don't have to write this at the moment. And calling that, for example, navigation and then via CSS making that look like a navigation menu. And that worked, and it still works, but then the committee that worked on HTML5 said, because a lot of people are doing this, let's invent a tag that handles this, that gives this meaning. So we have a header tag, not head, header. So anything within the header tag is supposed to have a meaning that it'll be in the head of the document like a nav bar, like a logo of a website. What else is up on the header, maybe? The labels. Some sort of labels or tabs for navigation and so forth? Yeah. What's that? Contact. Perhaps contact information. Sometimes you see on the top right corner an email or a phone number. What's that? Social media, Social media links, perhaps. Maybe a search box. So anyway, header is, has then been invented to give meaning to whatever we put in the middle of those that should go at the top of the document. After that, we have another one. This one called article. 
and even though the new tags are, are named pretty well and you can tell its meaning by its name it was a design by committee so I think article here might not have been the best name but the article tag serves to display the main content of a page article it makes more sense when we look at let's say this website here we can imagine we've got a header tag at the very top that is displaying the logo and the navigation and then we've got a main content area that includes this stuff over here the example this would be the article and then on the side we could have a sidebar but this is the main article area we could also see that it might be divided into sections here too this top section of HTML this section of CSS and the actual content in this section could be that article there and um, again I'm saying that particular one that particular tag I think it didn't it wasn't named as best as it could be but I'm showing you here I would think that that CSS column right there that would be an article and then next to it would be another tag which will which will also look at called sidebar or I mean aside there's one called aside so it's something on the side but in our purpose here what we're doing is we've got the section tag which will be our, our a screen full of content we've got the header section which will include the nav bar and other top stuff we've got an article which will include the main body of the app and then after article, after head, at the very bottom of the document, we'll have footer. Footer content, like, like some sort of uh, status bar at the bottom of our app. That's footer. Open footer tag, close <coughs> footer tag. So now we'll take what we wrote down here and we'll fit it into place. We've got header, article, and footer. Heading one, heading two, and paragraph. Well, let's move the heading one line. And what I like about Notepad++ is that you can literally move. If you select that line and then click and drag it right there, you moved it. Just like moving an icon. So select that line in my case 21 where I'm writing semantic HTML select it and then just drag it up to header I'm gonna tab it also notice my best practices are to tab whenever I'm in a, a section of code this is optional we could have left it like that but you'll often see things are tabbed either with a tab or pressing space a few times I've put the H1 tag in the header because I want it to be shown at the top of my document as the first thing to define that this is this screen full of content. This screen that I'm going to look at is about semantic HTML. Think of it also in terms of like a book. This would be the top chapter title, header. This would be where it might say Instagram at the top of the app. within the article which is the main body of the app or the document this is where I'm gonna move both the paragraph and the heading to <clears throat> because again think of this as the main content area if you look at an app if you look at the Facebook app or Instagram or most apps you will see a top top bar that maybe names the names the app or has some sort of icons and such you know like the Instagram app that I've got here at the top it's got some navigation icons that's the that's the header then the content area and then it's got a footer with a few icons down here like post a tweet and so forth so make a note also heading one in a header you should do that you shouldn't put a heading one in the article 
you should use heading 1 up on the header because that's part of its meaning also. So I would always start with a heading 2 in the main article, and if we needed other subtitles, I would add a heading 3, and then I would use a heading 4 for the footer. So let's write heading 4, h4, in the footer. That way it gives us also, we're, we're adhering to semantic HTML. We're using the right tag for the right task. The heading 1 tag, its task is to show something big and bold and important, yes, but to give it the meaning that it is the most important thing on screen. And then we've got heading 2 and 3 in article, and then heading 4, it's the fourth most important. Visually, it, how it looks visually is one thing, but what its meaning is that it's the fourth most important element in the page, so to speak, and so it's in my footer. And for the moment, we'll write copyright 2015 You can write your last name. This is your project. And I, write, I want to write the copyright symbol. Remember, we've accessed UTF-8 at the top here, so we can access a variety of symbols. So I want to access the copyright symbol. So uh, after the word copyright, but before the date or the year, I'm going to write the copyright symbol, which is the ampersand, which is Shift-7 the word copy, and then semicolon. It's all one unit. Ampersand, which is shift 7, copy, semicolon. It should become italicized to kind of tell you this is, a, this is a, uh, a, an HTML character entity. It's a special code. This will be converted into something. It's not going to literally say on screen copy. It's going to have a copyright symbol. But we won't see that until we render the document. So I'm going to close up some of these empty spaces down here on lines 20 to 23, if you'd like. <coughs> My code so far, I'm going to save it. And I won't see the result until I run it again. So try that. Save it. Run it. And it should look something like this. It all pretty much looks the same as before. We've got the copyright down here, of course. Visually, there's not much of a difference. But structurally, there's a big difference. We are setting ourselves up to have a very powerful project. But this is what I've got so far. Does anyone need any help? Did it not look like that? No questions. Yes. What can I put my notes in the like, like when a screen is loading? No, just like, you know, like, for example, like uh, uploading our writing on the programs, I just need to put the notes and all the scenes. Oh, right. say, oh, comments. oh comments, comments, yes. We'll talk about comments in just a moment. Um, you can put them anywhere. Since they are comments, you can put them anywhere. And we'll, we'll, we'll add comments in a moment because it's good practice to comment our code. So, did that work for everyone? Notice how the, uh, the copy was converted into the copyright symbol. Over at w3schools.com, we can look up the whole list of what else, what other symbols can we write here. Uh, for example, just for fun, I can uh, write here, for example, the yen symbol. It's the ampersand yen semicolon. Now I have yen. I think we can do Euro. Right there. We have other symbols. Uh, here's a fun one. We can do hearts. A little heart symbol. We can do the accent on, um, on words, like in other languages. Um, like let's say I'm writing uh, in Spanish, ole, but I want the little accent mark. So 
So I can do ampersand E acute semicolon. There we go. So notice these, I was writing them separate from others, so there's a space. Here I wrote the O, L, and then the character entity, ampersand E acute semicolon, and then when it's rendered, it looks like the little accent mark on the E. So again, go check out w3schools.com and they'll have a list there or, or you can also do a Google search and look up HTML character codes. HTML character codes. And you'll get a variety of websites out there like w3schools where it'll show you Greek letters, some symbols, we could do some arrows. And this shows you oftentimes the numerical value or the you know the word version. Like I did hearts. Hearts is also ampersand pound ninety eight twenty nine semicolon. But it's easier to remember hearts, isn't it? Not everyone is gonna have a simple name to remember them by though, and there will be a code that you can use. Let's write a little bit more, then we'll take a break. I said that what we're writing here are modern HTML5, semantic HTML5 codes, tags, so that we can divide up our project into multiple screenfuls. Let's make one more screenful, then we'll take a break. Basically, you can copy and paste this, but for practice, I'm going to write this again by hand. I need to rewrite the whole thing here. Again, copy and paste, you're done. But I usually do things the hard way the first time, or two, and then after that, shortcuts. So after the section that you created up here, line 20, let's do the same thing again. Write a section, open close tags, write a header, write something in a heading one, write the article, write something there, whatever you want, write the footer, write whatever you want there for practice. Header. And again, notice the way I'm doing it. I always write the pairs of tags, even though I know I'm going to write something between them. I prefer to write the pairs of tags so that I don't forget to close the tags. Because if there's a tag that needs to be closed and you don't close it, it might break your whole project. Article. Footer. As I set up on header, you want to have the heading 1 tag there. I'll just write here uh, page 2. So I'm just writing something. Again, I didn't write an H3 because I didn't really need it, but I do want to get into the, uh, the habit of using H1 in the header, H4 in the footer, and then I can use H2 and 3 within the article, within the main body. So write something like that, save it and run it, and what do you see? 
Well, it sounded like I was selling you that as soon as you write these magical tags, you were going to have page one and page two. Not yet. <laughs> that comes with a little bit more. But we're setting ourselves up. We're setting up our foundation using the right tags with a little bit more code, specifically some CSS. We are then going to make those actually be separate pages, separate screenfuls of content. But this basic structure is what we need first. We're going to save this and take a break. And when we come back, we will write that code to actually make it like real pages. So it's 7.05. Let's take a 10-minute break. If you'd like, I'm going to put my code in the network drive at this point. If you'd like a copy of it, you are free to take it. If you need any help, call me over. If you are new today, perhaps ask someone that has a computer uh, to borrow their computer so that you can register for the class. You need to register for the class, please. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Just one moment.